What we're going to be talking about is the challenges in the diagnosis of rare bone diseases. And I think it's really great that you're here and that we are in the era of sort of actually being able to improve the care of patients with these rare diseases. And one of the challenges we've got is obviously a lot of us in our clinical practice are not going to see many of these cases very often. And actually, it's then being aware of the triggers and understanding to identify patients. And it's one of the, the things we'll often see that getting the diagnosis in a timely manner is actually really challenging for a lot of people. So actually being able to improve that is critical to, to improving the management. This session today is actually unique in the fact it's a sort of medical education symposium uh, under the banner of the Rare Bone uh, Disease Pharmaceutical Consortium. And this is basically from independent sponsorship um, from Ipsen, Alexian, and Kira Kieran. And say so the program is fully independent. Uh, the content's not been influenced at all by the pharmaceutical um, consortiums. And basically, it's the um, responsibility of myself and the, the other panel members. And say, so, the idea is, is that this consortium is going to raise awareness of bone diseases uh, through medical education and with the intention of improving the outcomes uh, and the quality of life for people uh, living with them. So I'm an adult um, bone doctor working in London. The other panel members are Maria Luisa Brandi, uh, an expert from, from Florence, Italy, and Lothar Seafried, also from uh, Würzburg in Germany. So we've got an expert panel. And again, um, hopefully you'll, you'll learn an awful lot um, from, from us. As I say, we're going to talk about starting off with challenges in the diagnosis of fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, and I'll be talking about that. Maria Luisa is then going to talk about FGF23 uh, related hypophosphatemic rickets, and Lothar is then going to talk about challenges in hypophosphatasia. And then there will be panel discussion and questions at the, at the end of the whole session. And again, the idea will be that, you know, you, you can sort of put your questions online, those of you that might be attending online as well, uh, and then there will be questions and answers at the floor at the end of all the, spe of the speakers. So I'm going to start uh, talking again about probably this is the rarest of the diseases that you're going to hear about today, and I suspect many of you, you know, will, will never have seen a case uh, of, of this condition. Uh, here are my uh, d uh, disclosure and, as, and, and, and disclaimers. So essentially, for those of you that have never been aware of this, of this condition, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, um, is a really rare um, disorder. It's probably in the region of about one in a million uh, individuals are affected. So it's extremely, extremely rare. The disease is characterized by sort of progressive heterotopic ossification in the soft tissues. This heterotopic ossification uh, is cumulative, so patients over time will just gradually become more and more disabled. Uh, and restricted in, in what they can do. It's associated with premature death, probably about sort of 40 to 50 years of age, often due to respiratory comp uh, compromise. And one of the hallmarks of the disease is that you get these episodic flare-ups uh, of soft tissue swelling, uh, which then will settle, but then they're, they're, you get left with the heterotopic ossification. So they can also be, in addition to that, a sort of a more gradual, progressive, slow burn almost of, of ossification will happen which again can cause individuals to become more, more disabled over time. So how would you diagnose it? Well, it is a genetic condition, but actually the characteristic when individuals are born with this condition is they have these mal-shapen greater toes. So they have this sort of abnormality. Often it will be put down as hallux valgus, and that's the sort of what often the, um, the, uh, the obstetric teams and the, and the newborn teams will, will, will describe it as. Often it just gets pushed to one side, or maybe it gets told that people can sort of think about sort of straightening the toes uh, when, 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 the, when the individual's a little bit older. Now, there aren't many you know, genetic causes for sort of abnormal big toes. And actually, again, I would be saying this, is, this should be one of the triggers that should actually get you know, healthcare professionals just contemplating, could this baby have FOP if you see a toe like that? And actually, you know, that's often that it doesn't get picked up by the medical professionals. And actually, it gets picked up by the parents often who think it's not right. And they will be the people that then go on and Google and look at other ways of seeing if that's the case. If any work, people working in the pediatrics sector are seeing this, that should be one of the triggers. It's the most obvious thing that can be seen. If there have been x-rays taken, again, there can be characteristic x-ray appearances, which should give a clue that this individual may have FOP. Sometimes you can get these um, sort of osteochondromas around the, around the knee joint, and you can sort of see um, here that we, we, we have the sort of abnormality seen here. Often individuals, again, the, the babies that are born can have sort of ossification in, in, in the vertebrae, in the cervical spine. 
And again, this can affect the child in the fact they can't extend their neck very easily and they may not be crawling. Uh, they almost go from bottom shuffling to standing uh, because this, this abnormality here prevents the extension. They have abnormalities sometimes in, in, in the thumbs and then they have this characteristic, it doesn't show too well on the sign here, but actually again in, in the big toe. But again, sometimes babies and the children can be sort of almost in an orthopedic setting or being seen that they've had x-rays taken, but people haven't put the two and two together. And so again, that's something that, that needs to be aware of. Again, that sometimes these individuals, are, their x-rays are there, but the, the things haven't been put together. So if it's suspected that you have this condition, the simplest way to confirm it is with genetic diagnosis. There's a single point mutation in the ACVR1 gene, and basically most patients have a single gene defect. 97% um, of individuals will have exactly the same defect. So it's a very, once, once you suspect the diagnosis, it's extremely easy to confirm this uh, in a genetic test setting. And again, for those of us working in healthcare systems which enable genetic testing, it should be very straightforward to confirm or refute the diagnosis. But again, just to show that doesn't always happen, uh, again, this is a case study that's been, um, be, be, been published, but again, this was a 16-year-old individual, um, basically, who'd had pain and swelling um, and had had sort of biopsies um, taken. And basically, you can see from the story that was presented, this individual, we know, started to develop problems with stiffness and sort of restricted movement at the age of nine. So actually, this took a seven-year sort of diagnostic time before, before the diagnosis was made. And by that time, he'd, he'd actually had sort of, you know, quite a lot of bony swellings with, with, with abnormalities. By that stage, things had actually progressed. There were changes, again, seen here. That you can see the ossification, the soft tissues at the neck. We have the abnormality in the great toe. And again, the diagnosis was confirmed with genetic testing. So again, this study highlights that, again, you know, even though this, this was a genetic condition, it wasn't diagnosed till the age of 16. And again, with the identification of the gene, what we're now understanding is much more about the pathophysiology of this condition. And again, there's episodes here of obviously inflammatory processes that can happen, so after trauma. And basically, when you have the mutant receptor, this, this whole process gets sort of activated and, and sort of hypersensitive. And basically, you then move down this pathway to develop heterotopic ossification. And this sort of understanding the genetic pathway is obviously then will enable us to actually identify targets that in the future hopefully will become therapeutic uh, options uh, for this condition. Again, this is just an illustration of the sort of symptoms that an individual with the condition may, may develop. So they get these episodic swellings. Here we see a swelling uh, on, on the back. Uh, and these, these can obviously swell up quite quickly and then settle. And again, from a natural history study of the condition, we can see that sort of the mean age of symptom onset is about four uh, years of age for quite a few of the younger patients. But again, the mean age of sort of, um, sort of diagnosis can flag a bit behind that. But again, the challenge here is, is that, you know, again, and I'm sure a lot of you might be in places of work where you'd be thinking, if, if you saw an epi a child with, with something like that, your first point of the conflict might be, is this cancer? You know, and therefore the, the worry might be that someone then might go and biopsy, which is actually one of the worst things that you can do, because that will cause trauma and then will cause things to develop. So it's actually trying to make sure that, that your multidisciplinary team is aware that swellings like this, on the context of big toe abnormalities, should then make you sort of very highly suspicious of, of, of FOP. And again, this just shows the symptoms that, that can cause these sort of flare-ups and swelling. So again, it's just, it's just being aware of the, of the sort of the nature of the, um, of, of, of the symptoms that individuals will, will describe. And you can see, again, swelling and pain um, are, are important. And again, sometimes there is a delay in people realizing that they're actually having a particular problem. Well, hopefully, by the end of this short presentation, you're going to be clinicians that understand how to make the diagnosis. But what we can see is that misdiagnosis for this condition is very common. Again, sort of, you know, over half of patients that were sort of in a survey had been misdiagnosed. They'd often had sort of, say, biopsies because people thought these swellings were cancerous. And again, that just sets up a massive flare up of the, of the condition. And again, you can see the sort of the types of conditions that people thought they may have had, some sort of malignancy or soft tissue sarcomas. These are all pretty rare conditions as well. So again, you're, you've got a rare condition with rare sort of differential diagnoses, but again, just shows that there's a lot of education still needed uh, to try and improve, uh, improve patient outcomes. Again, just as again, take home for the non-specialists, the type of, in these individuals with FOP, whether they're children or even as they go into adulthood, you want to try and avoid trauma. So you want to avoid surgery unless it's life-threatening and sort of needs to be done immediately. 
Obviously, you also want to try and avoid intramuscular injections, and that would include vaccines. And again, in the current climate, sort of what you do with COVID vaccines is, is also quite challenging for, for this patient group. Again, not all these patients are going to come under the care of an expert, you know, even you know, an endocrinologist or, or a rheumatologist or a, or a bone specialist. Again, there are a lot of other doctors that are involved in patients' journeys. So again, it's almost taking messages away from here, taking them into the wider medical team that you may work with, because there's a lot of individuals that will see these patients in their journey and trying to make the diagnosis quicker is going to be critical. Again, for such a rare disease, it's really important if you can, to, both in addition to you looking after them or other people having access to experts. Again, we're fortunate, I think, in Europe that we've obviously got the European reference networks. Um, and again, obviously, we don't have them in the UK anymore uh, because we're, we're no longer part of uh, the EU. But again, but we, but we know how to tap people into these things. There's also a very strong international group of sort of FOP experts. But again, trying to sort of you know, tap into those knowledge things is actually really important help with diagnosis, to help with management. And again, for, for such a rare disease, the other important thing is, is for patients and you as clinicians to have access to sort of charity and patient support groups. And again, we're really fortunate in Europe, that again, for such a rare disease, there are very strong patient support groups. And these are just a number of them that are sort of from ver the various countries across Europe. Uh, and also there's an international group as well. So Again, for any of you that have got a patient, perhaps with this condition, or if you want to find more out about these conditions, this will also help you um, in, your, in the support that you can offer uh, for, for, for the patients under your care. So to summary, I say FOP, ultra rare, one in a million uh, individuals with the disease. But actually, if you recognize the greater toe abnormalities at birth, this should raise suspicion of FOP. Again, there are swellings that, that could, are episodic and can be there and gone one day and the other. But basically, if you suspect it, you can confirm with genetic testing, and that will basically give you your diagnosis. As I say, avoid the biopsies, avoid trauma. Um, and again, if you are suspecting or just need advice to know what to do next, you know, seek expert help, because again, that's the only way that you can really then improve care is, is for us all to pull together and to help uh, improve things for the individual patients. So that's FOP. I will hand over the microphone to Mira Louisa. Thank you very much. And now we will talk about a disease that should be of interest for endocrinologists because we have to deal with the hormone. So is, are those conditions that are hypophosphatemic and linked to FGF23 that is a hormone? So it's something that obviously this audience should have an interest in. These are my conflicts of interest. And uh, the hormone is controlling a metabolism. Uh, we in the area of bone metabolism have been always focusing on calcium metabolism, uh, about which we know enough uh, at this point. But phosphate metabolism is young also in our field because it was something that we are not really, really be looking at. I would say that phosphate metabolism in mineral metabolism has been overlooked for many years. But we know that, in fact, we absorb phosphate through the gut via the sodium phosphate transporter to B, and then the phosphate gets into the extracellular fluid, and then it gets into the bone, where it's exchanged like calcium every day through reabsorption of bone and formation of bone. And then it gets into the kidney, where it's filtrated and reabsorbed to the sodium phosphate co-transporters A, A, 2A and 2C. And parathyroid hormone is controlling this system because parathyroid hormone is increasing phosphaturia. So what we can say is that the system is well recognized. And we know that, in fact, uh, today, Together with, phosphate, with parathyroid hormone, we have another actor, that is FGF23. This is a hormone that is in fact produced in osteocytes. So uh, we should say today that is a hormone produced by bone, so bone becomes an endocrine system that produces a hormone. And the synthesis is uh, very well controlled by systems that are either um, decreasing the production of the hormone, so controlling negatively the hormone production, as well as by systems that are controlling in a positive manner, like also via glycosylation, the production of the hormone. And one gene that we are very interested on is this gene 
called facts, that this an endopeptidase that is able, in fact, to um, um, decrease the production of the hormone throughout uh, a real digestion of the peptide. This system, um, then through FGF23, is able to control phosphaturia. So when uh, um, the FGF23 is produced in two much high levels, like we have when we have mutations of the FAX gene, for, for example, we have an increase of phosphaturia and a decrease of phosphatemia. Also, this hormone controls in a different manner than the parathyroid hormone the uh, production of calcitriol at the kidney level because it's able to decrease the 1-alpha hydroxylase. So different than parathyroid hormone, that FGL23 is going to decrease the production of the calcitriol that is the hormone that facilitates the absorption of phosphate at the intestinal level. So it would be then the worst position for a patient to be in a condition where the, uh, there is too much of phosphaturia and not absorption at the gut level. And one of the measurements that we are using uh, that is something that is not in the routine measurement of the endocrinologies usually is also not only the phosphate measurement, but also the transport, the maximum transport of phosphate. That is something that can be easily measured, measuring uh, creatinine in, uh, in the urine and in the serum, as well as uh, uh, phosphate. And this has been also normalized for the different ages. As you see, it changes with sex in the adult and it changes in children at the different ages. So FGF23 is a hormone because uh, we have a production on one side and in fact on the other side is uh, metabolism and uh, also is production is strictly controlled and there are receptors that have been recognized. That defines a hormone in uh, endocrinology. There are implications for human disease either in the excess of FGF23 as well as in its deficiency. And there are drug targets for FGF23 related disorders. So that is obviously of interest in, for the endocrinologist. And hypophosphatemia, when we get to the diagnosis, uh, we have to keep in mind that this uh, uh, ion is strictly controlled, like calcium, like any other ion, by the way. If we have hypophosphatemia, the mechanism that can be generated hypophosphatemia could be a reduction of the intestinal absorption, an increase in renal excretion, or a redistribution of phosphate inside the cells. The hypophosphatismia is mostly present uh, in the emergency room where we have causes that can, are really acute and so it's well recognized as a phenomenon by people working uh, in the emergency. But we see also as bone specialist hypophosphatemia that could be, for instance, present in primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism, in angry bone syndrome, in osmalacia, rickets, malabsorption, chronic uses of thiazides, excessive use of antacid, steatorrhea, and chronic diarrhea, kidney tubulopathies. And we have to understand that in these conditions, hypophosphatemia could be also generated by phosphatonins. And FGF23 is the phosphatonin that we measure in the circulation. But remember that there are other phosphatonins that at these days are not measurable. So that's an area that obviously is going to increase in the interest of the clinician in the future. And when we look at the causes of conditions of hypophosphatemia, we have to understand that we have conditions where in fact, the cause is too high levels of FGF23, and this could be either genetic, as you will see uh, different conditions, or could be uh, also caused by genetic, but not hereditary because it's a mosticism, uh, and also could be acquired, as we will see along this presentation, like it happens in tumor-induced osteomalacia. And so there are conditions where we have an increase of GF23 just because we are using a drug so simple as iron supplementation. And we have also conditions where we have hypophosphatemia um, not associated with FGF23. Like it happens, for instance, in certain conditions that could be genetic or acquired. Think about hyperparathyroidism. So in the differential diagnosis, obviously we have to keep in mind all these pieces of information. 
What happens on the so-called X-linked hypophosphatemia that is caused by the mutation of the gene facts, the, not just the enzyme I showed you before. The gene mutated it does not inhibit anymore the production of the hormone, and now the hormone increases and increases the, the phosphaturia as well as it decreases phosphatemia. The condition is congenital, is inherited with an X-linked dominant manner, and the, the effect of the mineral digestion starts very soon in life. So the children then suffer of uh, rickets. And in fact, there is in children, in the pediatric age, the later um, uh, growth and um, cranial dysostosis, rickets, uh, and also some problems related to the muscle function because these children suffer not only of bone problems, but also muscle problems. In the adult, we will have fractures that uh, are uh, also pseudo-fracture and loser zones, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, extra osseous calcification just because the time of exposure to hypophosphatemia is much longer. And then uh, we will have also hearing loss uh, and disability. Both adults and children share a number of problems together, like the short stature, deformities, tooth abscesses and the number of tooth pro teeth problems that this patient suffered for, and also osteomalacia, bone joint and pain, joint stiffness, muscle pain, uh, chiari malformation, gait abnormalities, uh, and diminished quality of life in both of them. What happens instead in the so-called tumor-induced osteomalacia, we will see a clinical case later on. In this case, this is a condition that is acquired. Are tumors that are producing FGF23 or also other phosphatonins. In this case, the patient will not have deformities. It is just that one day, out of the blue sky, he will start or she will start to have problems in walking, pain, something that never happened before, and it comes to the clinician, and you have to ask for phosphate, something that not always happens, I would say. And when we talk about differential diagnosis, we have to think that we have conditions of rickets where we have defects on calcium. That's very frequent in problems related to vitamin D, either on the receptor, the metabolism, or the catabolism. So in this case, I have low phosphate because I do not absorb phosphate at the gut level. The problem is that in this case, I have also high levels of parathyroid hormone, and certainly the concentration of vitamin one calcitriol in the uh, serum varies. I have also conditions where I have phosphopenic rickets because there is a dietary phosphate deficiency or an impaired bioavailability. And also in this case, I have typical biochemical features. What happens if I have elevated levels of FGF23? In this case, I will have low levels of phosphate. I will have an increase in the transport of phosphate at the kidney level. Parathyroid hormone could be either normal or increased. So it's not a typical future feature, the increase of PTH immediately in, at the diagnosis. It can happen along the way because hyperparathyroid can be a complication in this case, but this could be related to the use of high phosphate. It could be related to the low levels of calcitriol and could be related also to kidney insufficiency because these patients can develop also this. And we have also another, other conditions that are related to the so-called phosphopenic rickets due to uh, primary renal tubal phosphate wasting. These are conditions genetically totally unrelated to FGF23, but in fact, I have hypophosphatemia also in this condition. So you see how complicated is this all matter when we have a patient in front of us and we have to decide what the disease of this patient is. So we are actually missing a link between hypophosphatemia and FGF23 mediated osteomalacia. We have to keep in mind then the biochemical features together with the phenotype. And we have to understand that hypophosphatemia could be either acquired or congenital. So not easy, not easy actually um, matter to, to take care of. But at least 
We have to understand if we see, you see here the congenital forms related to an excess of FGF23 that today we can Take, uh, we can take advantage of the genetic test. So what usually I suggest is certainly not only to look for fact mutation, but to create panels that today are available where the majority of the genes are included because this will facilitate our diagnosis. And certainly between the uh, XLH and TIO, the difference will be the story of the patient, the history before he was a child with problem or he was a child without any problem and without any clinical features of abnormalities at the bone development. So this is tumor-induced osteomalacia, another condition that can come to our office. In this case, as I said, this patient out of the blue sky, start to feel pain on the muscle. It cannot work anymore. It will tell you what happens to me. And then you make mm, DEXA scan and calcium and phosphate. And you have to look to the levels of phosphate now, not to overlook those levels, because they can become very important. The tumors that cause these conditions usually are small tumors. Mostly they are omnisexual in nature, and they produce the hormone. Not only FGF23, remember, also other phosphatonins can be expressed by TIO. And these are more difficult to be diagnosed because when we measure in the circulation, we don't find any change in, in the only hormone we can measure. And the disorder is usually described in adults. There are very few reports in children. And as I said, the person doesn't have major problems. We have just to go on an algorithm that is well described, where in fact we have to look at the clinical history, family history, Phenotype, I always recommend. Vitamin D and mineral deficiency have to be excluded, like malabsorption, primary effect paratalysism, and so on. If we have high levels of FGF23, we want to exclude, obviously, XLH and other conditions related to an excess of FGF23, and then we have to look for the tumor. That would be the big challenge from the moment on, because they are not easy always to be localized, and they can be localized anywhere in our body. Cold ones, I remember when we were studying this uh, in, at the university, strange tumor in strange places. And we, sometimes this diagnosis can be masquerading. You see here a case of 41-year-old female. Uh, the prior diagnosis was hypophosphatemic rickets. 26 years history of low phosphate. Can you imagine 26 years of low phosphate without a diagnosis? Loss of secondary teeth, no family history of low phosphate. The height didn't have major problems, it's just that she lost the height because of fractures. And she developed progressive gait abnormalities and decreased hip strength, and then she sustained bilateral hip fractures and numerous fractures at the spine. Uh, the, mm, the patient de deteriorated then over the years uh, because uh, she required a number of surgeries in order just to stand, and, and it was con she was confined to wheelchair at the end. The revaluation of any history resulted in diagnosis of XLH because she was so deformed, probably the doctor that saw her imagined that this was the problem. DEXA revealed normal bone density because uh, at this point this can be actually masquerade, but everything happened to her in terms of fractures and arthritis. And so uh, the renal ultrasound showed a four millimeter non obstructing culture at the lower pole of the right kidney. So there were kidney stone. There was, at that moment, the idea to look at the 13 gene in vitro phosphatemia panel that didn't show any mutation. So XLH then was excluded. And then the medical team finally suspected a TIO. And the TIO was confirmed because the tumor was found, in this case, through a 68 gallium data tape PET CT scan. So what's the message out of this, um, uh, of this uh, um, patient? First of all, uh, the genetic test could be useful if we don't take care about the clinical phenotype. 
I would never have suspected an XLH knowing the story of this patient. Importance uh, is obviously the personal uh, family and obviously the, uh, his the family history of the patients. We have always to take care of this. And obviously, XLH could be also a first mutation, not always is a family uh, story. So the pitfalls of using exclusively clinical criteria, we have to take care about everything, biochemistry, clinical history. So when we see patients like this, they are not easy patients, they are difficult. And we are also facing difficulties in terms of the use of the assays that are available for FGF23, because there are limitations. Um, obviously, we tend to use intact and C-terminal FGF23 in the diagnosis of hypoendiaphosphate MD disease. FGF23 is stable when stored at 4 uh, centigrade and, uh, and 22 centigrade for 48 hours. Then you are not able then to evaluate more anymore the measurement, and it's stable under five free stock cycles. And long-term storage can increase some variability, and the available assay don't give us superimposable data. So we are not in the excellence at these days in terms of the measurement of a hormone that for us as endocrinologists is so important because it's our referral biochemical matter. What we refer is the dosage of the hormone. So there are problems also in the measurement. So what we can then summarize is definitely, certainly FGF23 is a hormone that controls phosphate metabolism and is related to a number of congenital as well as acquired disorder that cause hypophosphatemia, where the transfer of phosphate will be uh, obviously in, uh, altered just because uh, of the problem of the effect of this hormone. The differential diagnosis with other uh, type of rickets should incorporate uh, certainly an educational background like we are starting now in the endocrine community that is related not only to the physiology of the system, but to the genetic of the system and to also the recognition of the clinical feature of the patients. And what we call the bone doctor, that each endocrinology, by the way, could be, should really be informed about this, because there, are, there is so much changing in this area for the future, and we need really to learn how to diagnose these patients and how to handle the management that will be obviously a clinical management and pharmacological of these patients. Thank you for your attention. So, great to see you all here. May I ask you a question up front? So, who is regularly seeing patients? Where are the clinicians? Just, just raise your hands, just show me. Okay, that's the majority. And for all the rest, I didn't forget about you. I will come back to you. It's just that I have to awake the clinicians before they're always tired. So, question to the clinicians. Who is regularly seeing patients complaining about pain, musculoskeletal pain and fatigue? Okay, pretty much the same crowd. Who is regularly seeing HPP patients? Okay, seems there is a discrepancy. Maybe we should make a difference in the next 15 minutes. And with that, I want to start with my disclosures and some, some basic sciences to include all the rest, the scientists in the group, um, to talk about hypophosphatasia and the genetic background. So hypophosphatasia is actually a genetic disease caused um, by variants in the ALP gene located on the short arm of chromosome 1 up here, so nicely depicted on that picture. There is a wide range of variants, and the, this gene actually is responsible for the vast majority of ALP activity that we detect in serum. So 50% coming from the bone, 50% coming from the liver, and all of that due to that specific gene. So if we have a if deficit in that gene, Serum ALP will be low, and that's the first learning that we should take as a take-home message. There are numerous isoforms due to nicely um, variants um, regarding glycosylation patterns. We don't have to go in that detail now, but that is what the, the lab does when they observe different isoforms of liver and bone, and there are actually several liver isoforms and several bone isoforms, but that's very, very specific. So here's the beauty of the enzyme. It's actually a dimeric enzyme 
Um, so composed of two um, chains, um, they have a GPI anchor, which is very important to reflect. So it's a membrane-bound enzyme. It's active within the tissue. So what we are essentially measuring in the serum is just the spillover or what remains when tissue is destroyed. So we can easily increase alkaline phosphatase activity in the serum uh, just by going binge drinking for a night. But that will not heal anything, even not hypophosphatasia. So the enzyme has to be active in the, in the tissues. It has to be active on the membrane. It has two active sites, and it's cleaving phosphorus conjugations, actually physically um, Easter bonds. There are more than 400 different variants that are known and conscious in that gene, and the number is still increasing. And the pathogenicity of these different variants is very distinctive and different. And that's why there are many approaches, and that's the most sophisticated one at the moment by Etienne Morny, um, to grade these um, different variants um, and make sort of a distinction from the genotype with regards to more severe, less severe variants, and the combination. So patients can have a compound heterozygous phenotypes of more or less severe um, variants, or just a heterozygous um, variant. And this, again, can be more or less severe. There's still a lot more to learn about that. But the major learning that we still can extract from that, from that manuscript is that the prevalence of the less severe variants, specifically in a heterozygous constellation, so patients bury only, bearing only one variant, is not uncommon. So the prevalence indicated here is 1 in 508, and I would agree. That's why you probably have seen more HPT patients than you have been aware of so far, and maybe this will change as of next week. The pathophysiology be behind HPP is actually pretty simple. So if the enzyme doesn't work, phosphorus bondages will not be cleaved, and we have an accumulation of inorganic pyrophosphate, which is actually the key marker of the disease. The problem is that we cannot measure that in clinical routine lab assessments, and that has a very complex background I will not enlarge on right now. We just cannot. Um, it is only reserved at the moment um, for scientific purposes, but still, this accumulation of inorganic pyrophosphates eventually prevents and precludes mineralization. That's why severely affected patients with hypophosphatasia end up having a mineralization deficit, deficit having a rickety phenotype in their bones. Along with that, they have a mineral homeostasis uh, disturbance. Um, so phosphorus and calcium cannot be integrated in the bones. Um, they have low PTH. Um, there is discussion about phosphatonin insufficiency. It's what I would guess rather a down regulation of certain phosphatonins. Again, I will not go into detail, but this is the second aspect that we have to understand. And the third thing is that alkaline phosphatase is responsible for cleaving um, pyridoxamine phosphate and pyridoxal phosphate, which is the active form of vitamin B6. But to get this form, into the brains, into the neurons, and across the blood-brain barrier. It has to be dephosphorylated transiently, and this is the responsibility of alkaline phosphatase. And if the enzyme is deficient, that doesn't work, and that's why patients have actually elevated levels of vitamin B6, specifically elevated levels of pyridoxal phosphate, but symptoms that resemble vitamin B6 deficiency. There are many more pathophysiological hypotheses and concepts what may, in addition, be caused by a deficit in that enzyme, and we'll, we will pass on that and just word to clinics now. The most severely affected patients become, become conscious. They become clinically apparent in early childhood, actually in a perinatal stage. Some are even stillborn, so it's an extremely severe disease. Those who survive the, this perinatal stage. They have breathing issues. They re need ventilator support um, because there is no, no bony formed thoracic chest. Um, they develop craniosynostosis, craniosynostosis, which is nicely depicted here. It's obvious. In an adult patient, you sometimes miss it because they have 
Most of them have more hair, not all of them. So, but you, you have to look for that. Um, the most severely affected patients or the more severely affected patients typically lose their deciduous teeth very early, not at the age of six, six or seven years, but at the age of one, two, three years, and very characteristically with the roots in test, in, intact. So the, what, what you see here is really something you can keep in mind whenever you see that kind of teeth. There are other conditions which may cause a similar um, tooth loss, but it's very, very uh, characteristic, almost pathognomonic for HPP. You see the knock knees associated with the rickettic phenotype. And here's a nice um, representation done by Michael White um, to reflect the rickets phenotype. Um, you can see and how you can identify um, childhood hypophosphatasia. We don't have too many pediatricians here in the room today. Pediatricians, raise your hands. Ah, a few. Okay, so please memorize that image because... That again is very, very, very characteristic. And we, you see these, this radiolucent tank, for example, you can always make a diagnosis straight. For the adults, it's much more difficult. So the, the picture, the clinical picture in adult HPP patients is way more widespread. So beyond the, the dental issues and beyond the, the bone manifestations, they have what we just were talking about. They complain about fatigue, which may or may not be associated with vitamin B6 deficiency. They have musculoskeletal pain, which they cannot really assign to muscle or bone or joints. They just cannot. And even after 15 years of doing HPP patients and seeing them every day, I couldn't figure out where the pain comes from either. They, they complain about weakness. They have some exhaustion when they... When they exercise that comes pretty fast, faster than in, in other um, healthy people. And that's what we should be aware of. So it's a widespread picture. It's very heterogeneous. And we should just keep our eyes and our ears open to identify these patients. This is data actually extracted from the global registry. And this is the first 300 adult patients that we looked at to see how they are like and what symptoms they have. And two major findings I want to, to bring in here. The first one is HPP is traditionally perceived as a bone disease. And this is correct in some regard, looking at the most severely affected patients where the disease become apparent in early adulthood, the so-called pediatric onset patients. They have way more fractures and pseudo fractures. And this is very common in these patients while in those patients where the disease becomes only clinically apparent later in lifetime, they don't actually have more fractures than the normal population. The second important finding coming along with that is the clinical burden of the disease between those two groups is almost alike. So here's, here are all the different domains of the SF36 quality of life score, and you can go through all the different domains, and it's this pretty much the same, no significant differences in any regard between those with pediatric onset and adult onset. So patients are suffering. And that's why I'm, it is important that you are aware of these patients, their symptoms, and that you can diagnose them. Diagnosis is actually quite easy. So they have the clinical symptoms we were talking about. Sometimes you have a family history that would guide you the way. And you have a hallmark that's low alkaline phosphatase activity. Yes, there are different reasons for low alkaline phosphatase activity, but still, whenever you find low or borderline low alkaline phosphatase activity, you should, check, you should look further and check for the reason. And if you have another reason, or if at a re-evaluation the levels are normal, you can pass on HPP and consider some other differential diagnosis. But if you have recurrently low alkaline phosphatase levels, you should really go for having a diagnosis and specif specifying what's behind. So you can determine the substrates we were just talking about. You can determine um, pyridoxal phosphate, so vitamin B6. Another substrate is phosphoethanolamine, which is ideally measured in urine. And that is very meaningful. And if that confirms your suspicion of an HPP manifestation, you should have genetic testing to really confirm the diagnosis eventually and know the variant you're facing. And then if genetic testing is negative, which may, may occasionally happen, you can again look for differential diagnosis and we can talk on that later.
But if the diagnosis is confirmed, you should have a specific workup, which is a comprehensive workup, considering not only the bones, but also the muscular function. You should do imaging. You should include the, the a dental assessment and an ophthalmologic assessment, because we have this widespread um, clinical manifestation addressing so many organ systems that caring for HPP patient actually requires a multidisciplinary team. You need, as Maria Luisa Brandi just said, you need a bone doctor who takes, who takes responsibility and coordinates all that. But you should be familiar and the colleagues should be familiar with the diagnosis. So to refer the patient for additional assessments, check for nephrocalcinosis, check for eye calcifications, um, check for dental issues and all that stuff. I will, again, not go into detail. It's just that you have to be aware of that. For those of you who want to read more about that, I would refer you to the paper um, of a consensus group we had a few years ago. Um, what is written there still applies today. There's no need for bone biopsies. Bone biopsies are not diagnostic. They're interesting, but not diagnostic. The pathologists will not give you a diagnosis. He will, if any, give you some information about deficient mineralization. Those patients who have a severe bone phenotype, who have characteristically pediatric onset disease, they have characteristic bone manifestations, and some of them are represented here. So you see these pseudofractures, these loser zones, um, the diaphyseal aspect, uh, specifically at the femur, sometimes at the metatarsal bones. If you have something like that, please check the opposite side. They occur bilaterally in many instances. Um, you can see also here a loser zone uh, at the scapula, which is uncommon, but you see that in HPP. You see that the metatarsal bone, you see the copper beaten skull in the middle, which is actually a remnant of craniosynostosis and in increased intracranial pressure in childhood when the bone was still, still soft. And the subtracanteric fractures actually guide you the way to severely affected patients. So we did an assessment of the, of the first 15 patients with these fractures, and they all um, had an increased bone mineral density. I will say something more on that later. 10 of them had these fractures on both sides, and all of them had a compound heterozygous phenotypes, so clinical variants on both alleles. So that's really what determines the severe phenotype. And as a complicating features, half of them were on bisphosphonates erroneously before. This should not happen, so you should preclude um, bisphosphonate treatment from these patients. And 10 of them had hypovitaminosis D, which again should not happen. They should be replenished if they are deficient. I've heard things about they should be spared from vitamin D supplementation, they should not. So if they are deficient, please replete vitamin D deficiency in these patients. And again, hypophosphatasia is not another form of osteoporosis. So checking more than 100 of our patients for their bone mineral density, it appeared that they're essentially normal. There are some who are above, some who are below the, the average range, but um, you only, as a hallmark, have elevated, actually elevated um, HPP, uh, elevated um, bone mineral density in severely affected HPP patients with rickets due to the condensed osteoid. So you have erroneously high bone mineral density in those who are severely affected, but we have essentially, and that's the one to the very left in that panel, but you have no, essentially normal BMD in all the others not so severely affected. Um, and to conclude, and this is my last slide, we will not talk about treatment in detail today, but you should be aware caring for this patient again is not just straightforward, one drug fits all or one approach fits all. It is a, is a modular treatment and you have to assemble your blocks to meet the individual patient's need. This may or should comprise analgesics because patients have pain, as I mentioned before. They need some exercise intervention, physical therapy. The most severely affected one definitely can be helped with enzyme replacement therapy, which is available. But they also need a specialized surgery and all that. And that's why you need a multidisciplinary team to ensure um, and warrant appropriate treatment for these patients. With that, 
I have the summary to the left for those who want to get some details. I will not read it out. You can read it yourself. For those who are already out in Milan for a nice evening, you just look at the picture to the right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This is the question for Marie-Louise Abrandi, and thank you for your talk. I only have one patient with DIO, but I also missed the diagnosis for three years, even though I had suspected he had a normal level of FGF23, and I went through the genetics, and I did a CT scan on thorax and abdomen, and actually, and that's the point, he eventually had epilepsy, and he had a five centimeter tumor in the brain. So maybe we should also stress that while during the genetic, do a whole body imaging. And I was interested by your PET scan Dota talk, Gallium. Is that the best imaging you should do in this condition? No, you have to try any type of image that you see in the Yes, Heilsiko from Göttingen, um, Germany. I, as in the XLA, it's also to Maria Luisa. Um, our XLAX patients have uh, hyperparathyroidism. And uh, we know that there's a pathogenesis, but we know that there are also publications on children not treated who have a hyperparathyroidism. And what they saw when they analyzed the, th the parathyroids is that their effects gene expression in the parathyroids. And I wonder if you have a theory what FEX does in the parathyroid gland. That's a very good question. The deep drugs records on the expression of FEX gene. So, theory is that eventually the parathyroid gland is responsible for local production of FEX gene, could have a role in the control of parathyroid hormone expression. And all the figures that have been available up to now don't tell us very much what is going on. And your point is right. If we have hyperparathyroidism, we can have time. We can co impose uh, the excess use of phosphates. Uh, we have uh, the low levels of calcitriol, but this would have been enough to develop in the child this uh, type of problem. We don't have obviously kidney failure. So everything that we mentioned has pathogenetics to the child who is functioning. Also, the records on the control. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel Crowley, Dublin. I have a question for Dr. Seafried. Um, when I worry about hypophosphatasia, it's in patients who have had an atypical femoral fracture with bisphosphonate, often of very short duration, and if they perhaps have a muscle phenotype maybe beforehand. 
Do those patients with a milder phenotype have the capacity to mount some ALKFOS response to a fracture? Is there a pattern that we could track that would show this is different to other patients? Is there a clue at fracture? Okay, oh, I better know. Um, that, that's a very good question. So first thing, if you have this type of fracture, you can assume that the patient should be more severely affected. I would guess he has a compound heterozygous phenotype, as I just showed you. Almost all of those with the fractures have a compound heterozygous phenotype. Um, and to some extent, um, you can increase alkaline phosphatase activity in these, so that it is somehow responsive, for example, to medical intervention. We, if you prescribe teriparatide, for example, which has been done occasionally, they will increase slightly, but not too much. And that's why these are actually the candidates for enzyme replacement therapy. If you have some even milder affected patient who is at the borderline low alkaline phosphatase normally, and you treat that one for osteoporosis, for example, with teriparatide, he will respond very strongly and he, you can increase alkaline phosphatase level from 30 to 70 or 80. And that's another hallmark actually of less severe hyperphosphatasia, while in those who are severely affected, the, the, the level of increment you can achieve is limited. So, and that's why healing is actually compromised. So some have the capacity to heal, even though it takes longer than in non-affected patients. In some, the healing capacity is insufficient and the fracture or the, the loser zone will not even stabilize over years. Thank you. Hi. Temperati Florence, congratulations for your talk. I have a question for Dr. Siegfried. Uh, so about these adult patients, so they have a copy of alkaline phosphatase. And so what do you think about muscle wasting and uh, myopathy in these patients? Because vitamin B6 uh, functional deficiency can contribute. So do you think that forcing the system with the high doses of vitamin B6 uh, could be uh, of any use in these patients or not? That's a ve another very good question. So the, the hy potential hypotheses that are communicated about how this muscle weakness and exhaustion comes about is extensive. I, I, I could quote five nows and I give you some more that I have in the back of my mind. So it's, it's complex. We just do not know where the weakness comes from at the moment. Um, the hypothesis that it may be associated with vitamin B6 deficiency is valid. Um, and to be very open, I tried both. So initially there has been a concern that give, providing Vitamin B6 may even increase the B6 levels, and that's why it was um, avoided initially. Um, we tried to avoid B6 from the nutrition and anything. It did not improve anything. Then there was another consideration that if at least 5% of vitamin B6 we have is dephosphorylated, dephosphorylated why not accept increasing the levels in extensively so we, if we have vitamin B6 level at 800 nanomole, we would still end up um, with having 5% of that dephosphorylated, which may be sufficient to overcome the clinical issue. And again, they didn't work. So neither way was successful in what we tried. Um, so there's still work to be done. Okay, thank you. So I've got one question that's come in. Uh, I think it's to do with TIO, um, which is, is there any, I mean, if you don't find something on the dose tape scan, is there any role, and again, I've seen this as well, is there any role for sort of selective venous sampling? I've had sometimes where people are measuring FGF23 to see if they perhaps can localize which body part it might be coming from. Sure, as I was mentioning before, yeah. is very important. It's something that endocrinologists use very often in diagnosis, so it wouldn't be unusual for endocrinologists to use this technology, but it's important that the FGF23 is increased. Yeah. We have to remember always uh, that if it's not increasing, uh, the tissue could express another phosphatonin. And we will know that only when the tumor is going to be taken out, because we cannot measure other phosphatonins but FGF23. So keep in mind this, do not exclude TIO because FGF23 is normal. We still have to look for if we have excluded other hypophosphatonic conditions.
And another question also, any explanations for the, because my, again, the experience sometimes is that in TIO, the muscle phenotype is very different to what you see in XLH. Um, they, they both, that depends on, yeah. uh, because TIO is like something that happens suddenly. Yeah. So, and then it's very difficult to compare uh, in any type of congenital condition, uh, people adjust. It's like you are adjusting yourself to a low level of phosphate and to, you tend to bear this in your life because you were born with that condition. Different is when you have you start this out of the blue sky. It's very similar to what happens uh, in hypoparathyroidism, congenital hypoparathyroidism, acquired hypoparathyroidism. People with acquired hypoparathyroidism where we have a problem of hypocalcemia have a very acute effect with symptomatology that is much more important. Certainly, these people suffer, I would say, more. It's just that they cannot understand and they are not adjusted. The others uh, have been adjusting along the line. And again, a question for you, Lothar. Um, you, you sort of implied, I think, that perhaps we're, we're, we're looking in the wrong place sometimes for some of these HPP patients, as in they're not all in the fracture clinics. So maybe they're in the chronic pain clinics. Have there been any studies looking at how common low ALP might be in the chronic pain, as in it might be more of a rheumatological, they could be languishing in a lot of rheumatology clinics. Um, I just wondered what, what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. But very important aspect is specifically those less severely affected who do yeah. not have a bone phenotype typically uh, or commonly end up in the bone clinic, uh, in, the, in the pain department yeah. um, or at the neurological department for chronic fatigue syndrome um, or at the rheumatologic department. Um, so commonly assigned to fibromyalgia. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's why it's worthwhile to really make a proper diagnosis. And whenever alkaline phosphatase activity is recurrently low, to really specifically and eventually genetically confirm um, the diagnosis because it's very helpful um, for the patients. Even though you do, cannot provide specific treatment for this, these less severely patients, uh, severely affected patients, it's important for them to be precluded from erroneous treatment. Good, thank you. And there's one other question again in that thing. I mean, I think what differential aspects would you have to be considered when you're investigating the lower ALP? I mean, I think you mentioned a little yeah. bit about the... So I mentioned that only briefly. So yeah. the, the most common one is actually if patients are on um, anti-resorptives. That's, that's a very common trait, specifically potent anti-resorptives. Um, denosumab, for example, in the long run really lowers ALP activity and can lower it even below the uh, limit of no lower limit of normal. Um, again, estrogens can, for example, lower the activity and after surgery and in, in um, anemia, for example, you find also low ALP activity. Good. Okay, well, I don't think there are any more questions from the floor um, and no more questions online. So I'd say I'd like to thank everyone for your, for your, for your attendance at the, at the symposium. Thank you for the questions and answers. Thank you to our two speakers. Please do, you know, do provide us with some feedback. I think it's really important and it will help development of any more of these types of meetings. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.